You may be seated. We're going to take a few moments at this point in our service this morning to reflect on the death of the Lord Jesus Christ in the place of believers. We're going to open God's Word this morning. If you don't have a Bible, there are some men here that are going to walk down the aisles. Just slip your hand up. Let them know that you'd like to have a copy of God's Word. And uh, what a rich treasure to have God's self-disclosure in our own language. And uh, if you don't own a Bible, we would love for you to have one. So this would be our gift to you uh, to take home and to read for yourself. I'd like to invite you to turn in God's Word to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And we'll take just a few moments meditating on the first six verses of 1 Timothy 2 to prepare our hearts to celebrate the Lord's death. 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 6. God writes here through the Apostle Paul to Timothy, a pastor at a church in Ephesus. And he says, first of all, then I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings Be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Paul is encouraging Timothy here to pray for leaders, for kings and for those who are in authority. And and when he says, pray for all who are in authority, he, he, he doesn't mean all as in every single individual king and member of authority who has ever lived. Uh, but kings and authorities of all sorts and all kinds. And and this is really a shocking statement when you think about the kinds of leaders that existed in Timothy's day. You don't have to think long about the Herodian dynasty or the Emperor Nero to understand that this would be a difficult task. You, You want me to beseech the Lord on behalf of the enemies of the gospel, the enemies of the church, the people who are persecuting us? In fact, the emperor who would be responsible for Paul's own martyrdom. You want us to pray for that kind of person? And the reason for that is given in what follows. So that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in godliness and dignity, we are to be the best citizens the Roman Empire has ever known, says Paul to Timothy. Furthermore, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Notice how God is described in verse 3. God is a savior. Why should you pray for evil, wicked men who are actually your enemies on the earth? Because God is a savior. And he goes on in verse 4, God, a savior, desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And the word all here in verse 4 ought to be understood the same way all is understood in all of these verses in 1 through 6 of 1 Timothy 2. That is, not every single individual who has ever lived past, present, and future, but all kinds without distinction, without discrimination, without a a prejudicial view of the kind of people that God would love, the kind of people that God would save. God has set his loving affection and saving work upon people who do not deserve it. And what Timothy needed to be reminded is, you can pray for your governmental leaders who might be opposed to the very things you hold dear, because God is a savior. God is a savior of those kinds of people, in fact, all kinds of people. And so we pray for them. We desire to live godly lives before them. Further explanation is given in verse 5, and here's the key, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah is here called a man, emphasizing the fact that he came in the flesh and dwelt as a man. It's not to negate his essential deity. This was God in the flesh, God as man, born at Bethlehem to endure a death on the cross. And he is the only mediator. He is the only possible mediator. He is the only go-between between between the creator of the universe and sinful humanity. 
This points out the universality of the gospel and the exclusivity of the gospel. In other words, the gospel is universal. There's only one gospel. There's only one way to be right with God. There's only one good news. There's only one salvation, and it is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. It doesn't matter if you're a, a, a Roman in the Roman Empire or a babbler on the outside of the Roman Empire. It doesn't matter who you are or where you come from. It doesn't matter how good you've been before men or how bad you've been before men. There is one mediator. Jesus, the Christ, is not a regional deity. The God of the Bible is not the God of America as opposed to the gods of the other nations. He is the one true God. And there is only one mediator between God. This is the universal claim of the gospel for all kinds of men, without distinction, without prejudice. People from every tongue and tribe and nation and people are to be rescued by the blood of this Messiah. There is one mediator. This gospel is universal. And because there is only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, this gospel is exclusive. You can't get in any other way. And what God has provided through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the only way to life, the only truth, the only access to the love of God for sinners like us. And so it is Jesus' death on the cross that we remember as we take some juice, representation of his blood spilled on our behalf, as we eat some bread, a representation of his broken body, broken on the cross on our behalf. These emblems we take are a, a tangible reminder that the cost of our redemption was the infinite cost of the death of the Son of God in our place. If you're here this morning and you belong to Jesus Christ, you've repented and turned to Him, you have received forgiveness of sin and new life, we would invite you to drink the cup and eat the bread. You don't have to be a member of Grace Bible Church, you just have to be a member of Christ to do this with us. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, our invitation is a little bit different. Just let that juice and let that bread go by you to the next person. This is a tangible memorial for those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And it would actually be a danger to you to take part in this tangible memorial without having actually been changed at the heart level. And so I would invite you just to let those things go by. But, but don't let this moment go by in terms of examining your own heart Taking a look at the trajectory of your life and maybe fast forwarding 10 years or 10,000 years, where that trajectory leads. Listen, you need to know that today you could be a new creature if you will but turn your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ and experience the forgiveness of sin that he purchased at the cross. We would love to speak with you about how you can have eternal life today. Uh, perhaps the people around you would love to speak to you about how you could have eternal life today. Turn to someone today and find out. Find out about the Lord Jesus. We're going to take a few moments now, and, and believers, I would encourage you to examine your own hearts. Confess any known sin. Rejoice in the forgiveness that Jesus purchased. Make plans to put real repentance into place where that needs to happen. Make plans to reconcile relationships if you need to do that. Uh, when our opportunity for self-examination is complete, um, I will invite us to take the bread and the cup together. So today, hold on to that uh, cup, hold on to that piece of bread, and then we'll celebrate the Lord's death together in this tangible memorial. Men, you can come and serve us.